maillot. Il est le roi du vélo. Le monde entier l'applaudit. À propos quand il se met à rouler. Good evening and welcome to episode five of This Cycling Life. Um, tonight, I'm joined by my co-hosts, uh, Alan Davis uh, and Michael Rogers. You'll see today, I'm actually on my bike tonight because I've had a pretty hectic week, pretty busy day. Um, and I thought, what the heck, I'm gonna try to do a little bit of uh, multitasking tonight. So welcome to everybody. And um, we've got people joining us tonight from over 15 countries. Uh, it's fantastic to see the continuing support that we're getting for the program. Um, tonight, uh, because we've had so many people joining, your videos and microphones will be muted. Uh, but of course, we're gonna be interacting with you throughout using the Q&A function. So if you wanna you know, pose a question to us, um, anything you wanna ask, just use the, uh, the, the Q&A there. That's what we'll be watching um, and we'll be interacting throughout. So I'd like to invite in my co-hosts, uh, Alan and, and Michael. Um, my name's Jamie Anderson, I'm an academic and author a uh, speaker and of course a cyclist, an uh, Australian guy living here in Belgium. Alan, would you like to say a few words to introduce yourself? Absolutely, Jamie, thank you. Uh, welcome guys to another episode of This Cycling Life, number five we're up to now. Uh, I'm Alan Davis, I'm a former professional cyclist, uh, obviously a, uh, a coach, high performance coach at the moment and also working with the UCI as a technical advisor. Good morning, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon or good evening, no matter where you're coming from. My name is Michael, coming to you from a very, very wet southern Switzerland. Uh, I'm a former professional cyclist of 16 years and I'm currently working with Team NTT Professional Cycling. Excellent, thanks a lot guys. Um, as always, you know, over the last uh, couple of weeks we've, we've been collecting your questions. I mean, it's been really fantastic the level of engagement interaction um, we've had from people all over the world and you know when you send us those questions Mick and Alan and I we get together we, we talk them through and what we have seen over the last couple of weeks um, given the themes that we've covered in our previous episodes is a few um, recurring questions uh, and one of those questions um, actually that we got in this week has come to us regularly so we thought that's what we're going to hit this week and we're going to be talking to you uh, about the topic of descending. So why don't we just jump right in? Um, and Mick, why don't you read out this question that we've received from uh, Tom in the Netherlands? Sure, Jamie. So I live in the Netherlands, which is mostly very flat. How can I become a better descender and stay with the Italians who always seem to be very fast downhill? And I mean, Mick, what do you reckon? I reckon, I mean, I did, when I saw that name, Tom, I, I thought this could be Tom Dumoulin talking about Nibali. So I put his picture in there. What do you, what do you reckon? No, it has to be. I mean, of course. I mean, he watches us every, every, every weekend. He watches us. That's true. He's one of our big fans. And actually, I understand, actually, because we've, you know, we know that Tom is, is a supporter and he's actually a big supporter of Professor Alby. So we thought, why not pro invite Professor Alby in? to talk to us about this question. So, so Professor Elby, are you there? We'd love to hear from you. Hello, everyone. Welcome again. I'm back. Thank you. Thank you, Mick, and also thank you, Tom. Um, hope you're Elby. doing well. Um, yes, another great topic, another great question. Descending a huge part of our cycling um, at, all, at all levels, yeah, especially our audience are listening, guys. So uh, first of all, the biggest advice that I could start off with with, uh, before I get into my tips, is confidence. The confidence is a really big uh, element of being a good descender. I must add that in straight away off the bat. So uh, getting into it straight away, guys, I would, I would like to say get as low as you can, um, as low as you possibly can on the bike. You know, get down on the drops. If you can reach the drops, get down low and get your center of gravity as low as you can, close to the road. This will help you with traction. Um, uh, utmost traction with cornering is, is a huge uh, element, obviously. So uh, to being fast, you want as much traction as possible. Getting your gravity lower will help this immensely. So please do that and you'll, you'll find uh, straight away a big improvement in the settings just by doing this little tip. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we grew up in, in Australia, guys, and 
you know, one of the things that I used to used to strike me when I used to be training as a kid is I'd head out for a training ride and I'd ride in a straight line for about 15 kilometres, take a left, go straight for another 15. So the downhills were often pretty straight, you know. And then I came and lived in here in continental Europe and I was horrified because you have all these switchbacks and stuff. So, uh, you know, besides this low centre of gravity, how do we deal with those real sharp sort of switchback corners? Yeah, I, I can I can uh, understand exactly where you're coming from, Jamie. Um, you know, I'm the same. Coming from Bundaberg, a very flat country in the in the southeast part of Queensland, so uh, I didn't really get to you know be be a somewhat confident descender until I came to Europe. So the skills that you learn, um, you know, another one going into step uh, two that I have here is braking. You know, knowing how to brake and when to brake before the corner. You really want to do this before the corner. You don't want to be breaking through the corner. So, you know, the more experience you do and more practice you have, you get to, you, you get to learn when to break and how to break to, to be faster as also being, being a confident ascender, but also being a fast ascender. Professor Albie, why do you want to do all your breaking prior to the corner? Um, and and why? I mean, why why not why not dab the brakes halfway through the corner or you know uh, coming out of the corner, for example? What why should it be done prior to hitting the corner? Yeah, I mean, first of all, you use your. I'll go into step three here. Your peripheral vision automatically activates, right? So you 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 have your information in front of you. Your brain is reacting to that information you know when to break, your, bra- your brain will automatically tell you when to break. Uh, why you don't want to break through a corner is because of, you know, you, you could lose the front wheel, for example. Um, you know, can your front wheel distribution of your weight, yeah. Just, just for you know, of your weight, you lose your whole balance, your gravity goes off, off skew to what you already have mm. made yourself uh, very low and into. And this will, um, it'll make, it'll, you know, if you don't crash, you'll, if you don't crash, it also slow you, slow you right down. So it'll make you a lot slower going down the descent. And it'll bring fear into your descending, which is going, again, coming back to confidence will make you, will, will make you a slower descender because you'll, lo- you'll lose your confidence. Yeah. So you want to be breaking before the corner, taking in all the information that's in front of you. And of course, another one, a really good point here is that avoid fixation, avoid looking at the corner. You want to look through the corner so your your brain will automatically take in absorb this information it'll it'll work out the fastest apex of the road using the most of, m- amount of road as possible mm-hmm. and and it will make it a, a really easy uh it will make it a really easy uh, way around the corner automatically you know you'll be fast you'll be safe you'll be you, you'll exit the corner you'll be already thinking on the next corner and, it'll, and the more times you practice it the better you'll be at it. I mean, it's a good one you mentioned that, Alan. I mean, just also, you did explain to people you're from Queensland. I mean, just, we have to be clear for people like, because we might have some people joining us from America or something, like Queensland's actually a state in Australia. It's not a separate country. It's a, it's a big <laughs> state, though. Uh, yes. And people do, I mean, they do speak a bit slower there, though. I mean, some people, when you visit, they, they do say it's a pretty unique kind of place. But... Yeah, there are a lot of very long straight roads in Queensland, usually not going anywhere except for a sugar <laughs> plantation or something. But that's another story. Um, uh, um, Professor Elby, you, um, you also talked about this fixation thing to me. And like, when you said, don't be fixated, I'm thinking like, what does that mean actually? So I went and Googled it early on when I was working with you. And fixation actually means that like, you, you're, you're descending and you, you, know, you see the apex of the corner and you look at a pole or a tree and you're freaking out because you're going really fast. And of course you don't want to crash, but actually psychologically what you do is you become fixated on that pole or that tree and you steer towards it instead of away from it. So this fixation is a very common thing for, for amateur cyclists, inexperienced descenders. And it's actually very, very dangerous because you know, the last thing you want to do is actually steer into a tree or a pole. So this idea of looking beyond the corner, you know, actually choosing a point to fixate on, which is out of the corner, out of the bend is, it's not just fast, it's also safe, right? Very, very important. I mean, one of the things I wonder about that, because you mentioned confidence, Albie, you mentioned, you know, getting into the apex, you mentioned all that, but you may not be the most confident rider. So 
What about using the people around you? Or, I mean, you know, like you told me when we were in the Giro Sardinia a few years ago, follow the motorbike guys because they're local and they know the road. Can you talk a little bit about that? Other, other tips and tricks? Yeah, this is, this is also getting back to um, previous webinars where, where I do mention, do your research. You know, you will have races where there will be local riders in, in the race itself. So, you know, they will know the descents. So automatically, you know, if you find yourself in the position where you're behind these riders, you know, you have a bit more security about they know where they're going. Um, this comes into the research, uh, you know, the, the research basket that we, that we put it into. And it's, a, it's also another, you know, little tips that you, you can find are also just the lines on the road, the, light, the, the painted lines that we find on, on roads all over the world. You can get a really good long vision through corners by just gauging the, the, the line as, a, as is, you know, printed on the bitumen. So mm. another one that we used to use big time when uh, we had follow, uh, sorry, lead vehicles, you could really tell the body language of the motorbike rider. Um, for example, you could tell if you couldn't see the exit of the corner, you could really tell by their body language how the really the corner was, you know, if it was really steep, if it turned back on itself. So you automatically yeah. you knew straight away you could you could respond to to how that motorbike rider was reacting, you know. So it's all, you know, if you really got a bit scared, you know. You, you want to be a little bit harder on the brakes. Yeah, so. you, you could almost see it in their body language. And yeah. and from the motorbike rider, if it's a really tight exit on the corner, you can almost see the riders in front of you kind of tightening up in their upper body in in a period of caution, just it maybe only a split second. But it's really good peripheral information to be able to adjust your speed and say, oh, you know, there's something dangerous coming up. I need a little bit more caution. Yeah. Uh, compared to you know where I am right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And also, not only that, just the uh, other bike riders. You know, you could be in a line of bike riders, and you know, two or three riders in front of you do the same body language or do the same exactly same body movement. So straight away, you're on the brakes a little bit harder, right? So. Yeah. No, yeah, where? This, this local knowledge is also, of course, super important. And we've talked about that in previous years, but I've had some pretty special experiences as well. Like, like when I did the tour of Nilgiris in India, and like, I remember like going on this one descent, the Kalhati or something climb was called. And then the guys beforehand said, look, Jamie, watch out for the cows, you know, because there are a lot of cows in India. And as a European, that may not be something you're used to confronting on a descent. And actually, there was a bloke, a British bloke, David, who, who did hit a cow on a descent. Um, and my advice there is if in India, if you crash into a cow, don't stop. Don't stop. You pick yourself up and you keep going because they are sacred animals. So, but what about like, because there's also like in Australia, we have kangaroos and sheep. And there are different things you need to do, right? I mean, if, if the kangaroo's hopping along beside you, you know, it, it can, it usually bounds a few and then jumps across in front of you where the sheep pop and they're a little bit slower and they follow their, their kind of friends. I don't know, did you guys like in the Basque country or when you were in France, I mean, were there any real special local things that you needed to be aware of? Like sheep, kangaroos, cows, I don't know. Yeah, in the Basque country, it's stoned fans on the side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> Through the Basque country. So, yeah, the two of the Basque country, you, you, um, when you get into the big crowds, all of a sudden, this weird, strange smell of a certain grass. Oh, that stone, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah no, not, not the stones in the middle of the road, but stoned fans. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that was a... That's that was actually, that, that brings a whole new... That, that's a whole new concept when it comes to fixation, you know, because... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, I mean, that's... You don't want to do it. But that's an interesting one, because stone fans are obviously going to move slower than your average fan. Exactly. The, yeah. Dutch, the Dutch often, they, they like a bit of a tipple. They do get drunk sometimes on those, on those mountain climbs and descents. So I guess you've got to keep your wits. So it is about that local knowledge. What about the technology, Professor Albi? Because today we have Garmin's, we have mapping, you know, what, what about that stuff? Yeah, I mean, um, for sure, you know, we have to move forward with technology, like I mentioned in previous webinars as well. So this is a great point, Jamie. You know, it's there, you know, the mapping systems are there, the Garmin's and the so forth. So get on it, check it out. Um, even during a race, you can, if you're unsure, 
if you've even researched it before the race, just to go back to your Garmin, just to be sure again of the descent coming up, check it out. Just see what's what's coming up. I mean, we've all, I mean, I think Mick's also had the experience using a Garmin on a technical descent in a time trial, you know, without having to recon it before. So uh, it's it's definitely there. So guys, feel free to use it as much as you can. Um, also, we've seen a lot of development in the material. Uh, disc brakes, brakes. Well, that was one uh, of the things I wanted to ask, Gal, because, um, you know, it, it's probably quite a hot topic in, in the cycling world right now is between rim brakes and disc yep. brakes. Um, you know, both have their advantages. Obviously, obviously, traditional rim brakes are a little bit lighter, but when it comes to actually braking uh, efficiency, the disc brake bikes, I mean, they're just out of this world. Maybe you want to just chat a little bit about that? Yeah, Mick, I mean, it's a definitely a hot topic at the moment. It's been a hot topic for a couple of years now. It's pretty, the disc brakes were introduced a little bit after our time, mate, but definitely I, I can give you my opinion as now as a social cyclist, like many of our cyclist audiences are, um, mate, in the wet, especially the, 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 the benefits you have by be able, the simple fact of be able, being able to break later into the corners, yeah. um, especially in the wet, like I mentioned, that will, that's just a little top, that little tip will help you go faster down a descent. Um, and, and, and also, you have a really uh, better feel for the brake as well um, with using the hydraulic braking system. Yeah, there's um, no comparison, is there? No, no comparison, the so. I mean, Jamie, what do you use? I mean, I suppose I it doesn't... Listen, mate, I'm not one of these wussy disc yeah, brakes. But, but it doesn't rain much in Belgium anyway, so you don't need... You don't uh, need. No, listen, man, you know, like... You heard, you heard about the Flandrian people. Uh, Flandrian, that's... They're the tough guys, man. And, you know, for me, there's nothing more fun, actually, than kind of hitting a, a steep descent on a pair of Mavic Ultimates, you know, the ones with the polished surface, with a nice set of brake pads and rain. Because <laughs> yeah. it, kind of, it just gives you a whole new perspective on life. You know, you do feel lucky to be alive after you go through a descent like that, particularly like I've done racing something like the Giro Sardinia against those Italian guys who basically at the age of four, their mum pushes them down a hill in the pram and just lets them go. You know, so I don't know, I like a bit of that, but... But what do you, because I mean, we look at professionals, us amateurs, and we think you guys must all be built of steel, you know, like nerves of steel. And were you guys ever afraid? I mean, did, did that ever affect your descending me? Yeah, yeah. No, no. I mean, my, particularly my last years of my career, when I was starting to be a little bit more mature, let's say that, you know, and, and had children, and, and I was actually starting to think about what I was doing. I started to, to have a little bit of fear sometimes. I mean, I wasn't. I could I could hold my my day on the descents, but I wasn't known for descending. But definitely, you know, when you look down and you're going, you know, 95k an hour down a hill, and you know, you're on a bit of rubber so wide, it scared me absolutely a lot of times. What What about you, Professor Albi? Because you know, you're a bit you're a bit old school as well, man. I mean, you remember back in the day, like the 50s and the 60s, they didn't they didn't even have. They were using cantilever brakes back in the day, weren't they? I mean, what's your yeah. perspective on that? Yeah, back in my day, you know, in the 50s and 60s, actually, um, you know, it's not always lollipop uh, colours that we, we see today, but that's actually why we had black nicks, black, black shorts, because a lot of times it was to hide the, you know, the fear of people's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, you know the 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 outcome of being being fearful on the descents. You know, uh, but on a serious note, uh, like Mick, you know, as as I got to, got to be a father and had kids, it, it became a lot of it, you know, fear was definitely in there. But um, uh, on my day, you know, if there was a if there was a result to be had at the end of the descent, I would take the risk. But if there wasn't any result personally or to help another teammate, I would not take any risk. So that would be, that's my philosophy. But I don't know, guys, like, you know, like, uh, you know, in the Giro, Giro Italia a couple of years ago, they suggested actually that they were going to have the downhill jersey, you know, like the jersey going to the fastest downhill guy. I thought that was a fantastic idea. And then, then all these, these sookie guys started saying, oh, someone might get hurt. It's not a good idea. Isn't that part of the sport, though, to see a little bit of that, you know, see to your pants kind of that sort of stuff you were talking about requiring the black shorts and stuff. I don't know. 
Mick, did you have a view on that, on, on, on the downhill competition they thought they were going to introduce at the Giro? No, we did it one year in the Giro, Jamie. We did it, there was a, I think it was 2009, we had this big long time trial, we had two descents. And uh, my dogs are just joining me here, if you hear some growling. Um, I, was, I was saying uh, this big long descent in the two Giro time trials, they actually had, they gave a prize at the end of the day to the rider who was fastest on the descent section. So, I remember that, Mick, yeah. And I had white shorts that year. Yeah. yeah. Look, I, look, guys, I think we should move on. We should move on. I'm looking at the Q&A. We, we, we had a comment from a, uh, Andrew there about a, a Dan Martin um, experience on climbing. We'll, we'll maybe come and touch on that one a little bit later because Dan was one of the people. Actually, maybe, yeah, we'll come back to Dan a bit later. Um, but for the, for, for the rest of you, please do write your questions in. As we're chatting away here, having a bit of banter, please do jump in. Um, of course, we do have another copy we forgot to mention of the Eddie... Merck's uh, record, that we, we, the track we played you at the start, Bravo Eddie, we've actually got a limited edition uh, single, which we're gonna to give to someone today for the funniest comment or question that we get there in the Q and A box. So please do um, type something in there for us. Guys, I think we should move on. Jamie, you're in, you, oh, sorry to interrupt, mate, you're in great form tonight. Have you been drinking enough? Are you a little bit dehydrated or? Mate, I've been pushing about 87 watts for the last 40 minutes. <laughs> I'm getting a sweat. Oh, no, you're just in great form. And I thought you might have been recovery, mate, mate. a bit dizzy or exactly something. Recovery, I'm doing good. Look, the, the last thing I'll say here, Mick, because the other thing that, that, that struck me, you know, when I started working with Professor Albi, he recognised pretty quick that, you know, descending was not one of my four days. So he did get, get me to practice. Now, I do live in Belgium, so there's not a lot of steep descent. So what I'd actually do is I'd go to the car park of my local Dalhaise supermarket here, and I'd put on my son's uh, BMX, because my, my boy was racing BMX at the time, pretty big kid, and I'd put on his BMX armor, and then what I'd do is I'd go down the ramps of the car park and get as extreme bent over as I could, sometimes even falling off. And yeah. I actually found that helped me a lot, so. Yeah, that's really, that's really good advice, Jamie. Um, also, you know, a lot of the people will be experienced uh, descending you know, uh, uh, as a as a being introduced to cycling, not not at a you know as a middle aged uh, athlete. So, I, I I'm going to go to what uh, Mick, uh, one of his best quotes that he he's mentioned many times. If it's not happening in training, it won't happen in the racing. So the more times you can train, you can practice this. Like Jamie said, practicing on your lean, going out there, putting it into a descent, getting your confidence up getting your confidence right, the faster you'll go, guys, and the safer you'll be. Yeah, that's true. So, you know, we, we, did talk, we did talk early on an earlier episode of This Cycling Life about the benefits of plyometrics, and then I got all these messages from people saying, look, I've bought me plyometrics box and everything. So I think after this episode, there's probably going to be a rush on large size BMX armour for grown-ups. <laughs> um, and, yeah, the one thing I will say is that uh, I was hanging out a lot at the supermarket, um, and the only other people at the supermarket, usually after hours, are teenage boys drinking beer. And I did get questioned by the police at one time about why I was associating with these one, young guys dressed in tight lycra. So just, just be aware of that. Just be aware of that. All right, let's move on, shall we? We've got, let's move on to our next topic. Um, so Mick, why don't I read this one for you? Um, got a question here on aerodynamics from Peter in Australia. What are the tips and tricks to become more aerodynamic on a road bike? And do I really need an aero bike and expensive wheels? So, Michael Rogers, three-time World Time Trial Championship. I think you know, know a thing or two about aerodynamics. Why don't we hand that one over to you? Sure, more than happy to. Let me just... So, by far, the biggest force that a cyclist needs to overcome is, dynamic, uh, is aerodynamic drag. No doubt about it. Anything above 16 kilometers an hour, you're going to start to feel some kind of, of drag, all right? And when you get up to race speeds, 90% of your resistance, or 90% of, sorry, the resistance that the cycling cyclist has to overcome is in our drag. So in essence, what we want to do is we want to do everything we can to reduce that as much as we can, okay? So tip number one is stay as small as you can on your bike. So what do I mean by as small as, as you can? You need to reduce your surface area. 
So when you can get down on the drops instead of sitting up in the, in the traditional climbing position. Um, you want to keep your elbows in. You want to keep your, try to keep your knees in when you're pedaling as, as close to the frame as possible. Um, by reducing that, reducing that volume, in cycling we call it CDA. So you have to get that value down as much as you can. And just by doing that, it's, it's I mean, just by, by getting into the drops, you, you, you're dropping about 15 watts, which is a lot, which is a lot of, of power. I think we've even got a picture on that one, Mick, because we oh, yeah, good one. Yep. So actually, maybe you can talk us through these three positions briefly. Sure, sure. So if we look at the top position, let me just, I've got my, uh, I can't see that perfect on my screen. Let me just move. There we go. A top position, which is a, a traditional climbing position, you know, hands on top of the bars, heads up really, really high. You can see the amount of drag uh, that, that that's producing. So if you look at the, uh, the, the graph on the side, um, you can see that the red areas are producing a massive amount of drag. And as you have the, the blue areas are areas where less drag is created. Uh, so that top position, if you're riding down the street, you're expending a lot more energy to maintain a certain speed. Okay. So that's a bad position to be racing in. You look sorry. at, sorry. Sorry, sorry, Mick, I'm just looking at this position now at the top. You can see, as you mentioned, the big blue bits are the, are the, are the ones you want to look for if, so if you're in the bunch and you see someone riding like this, you see the big blue tail coming out of the top picture. They're the ones you want to be behind, right, Mick? Yes, in theory. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to be the guy, you don't want to be behind the guy down the bottom. That's for sure. No, exactly. Um, because he, he's going to crash. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's well, a good point. I mean, Professor Elby, you were spot on. Okay. Now, that's why I love racing in Holland. Because basically, like when I, I'm, I'm 168 centimeters tall, so yep. when I race in Holland, they actually call me the Hobbit. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I would have just pushed you off the road, Jamie. <laughs> look, I love it, man, because I just find this guy who's like I've got a photo of me with a Dutch guy, and he's 204 centimeters tall. Um, and I look for guys like that in the race. I sit behind him the whole whole race, actually, because it is aerodynamically very efficient. But Mick, talk to us a bit about the second one, because sure. that is pretty low, but can everybody do that? And can everyone hold that kind of position? Well, no, that's the thing. I, I think for the sake of, of demonstrating the differences b between the two positions, uh, this is very extreme. I mean, look at the rotation in the hips, look how, how flat the forearms are, how low the head is. Yeah. I mean, um, you're going to be pretty stiff in riding that position um, after about 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> but you can see, look at the reduction in the amount of that, that high drag or the red zones and the increase in, in the yellows, the greens and the blues. Yeah. Um, so it's basically all happening in the wake because once the air eddies, we call them eddies, once the, the, the air hits the body and eddies off, all the drag seems to be happening in the wake in these particular in these particular positions here. So I would say num the middle position is a very very efficient position. And, and Jamie, to answer your question, is that is that position feasible? Can you hold it for a long time? I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting one, Mick. I mean, maybe you know, Alan, you can talk to this because this was part yeah. of. Again, you observed me racing. You observed me. You know, either it was Kermis here in Belgium or some of the multi-day races and you actually got me working on course so I could hold a, a much more aero position for longer periods of time. So it doesn't just happen. You have to actually build that core strength to hold that lower position. Can you talk a bit about that, Albie? Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is, this is a, you know, a, a, a part of our training that we learned as professionals, Mick and I, and, and I also advise to my clients today, um, not only does it help you get into a more aerodynamic position, it keeps you more stable as well once you're there. Like imagine the guy on the top, if he doesn't have much core, which he, he mightn't have while being in that position to start off with. But put on top of that image, him moving up and down, bobbing up and down, you know, because of the way he, he pedals a bike. You've got you to imagine these guys are, are pedaling a bike and they're not just still positions. 
So mm -hmm. your core stability will help you be as still as possible, which will will generate less wake, what Nick says, coming off the back of you as well as not only making it easier to stay in a more aerodynamic position. Yeah. So, so I think, I mean, to summarise this one, Nick, uh, what you're saying to us is that, um, you know, this one is not good. <laughs> this one is good, but it's kind of, you need to practice it. You've got to get yourself into that, you know, training, core strength and so on. And this one, because the pros love this one, <laughs> but you were talking to us before and you said, listen, don't do it. You know, because we watch right. our heroes on TV. We want to do what they're doing. And Mick, you just said, don't do it, Jamie. Don't do no. it. Don't do Why it. not? It's aero, man. I've seen, I've seen Peter Sagan doing it. I've, I've seen Chris Froome doing it. I, I, don't yeah. think I've seen, I don't think I've seen Tom Dumoulin doing it. But why, why wouldn't I want to do that last one? Well, well, it's a little bit different. You know, the pros, the pros are racing on closed roads. Uh, there's been probably about a dozen cars or a dozen people uh, observe the routes and move all the rocks off off the road. Um, being in such extreme positions on descent puts your weight all on the front of the bike, and all of it all it takes is just a car coming other way, and and you're just a little bit slower to react. Yeah. Um, and boom, you're down. So safety first, really. I mean, it's not going to make a big difference for a lot of our audience if, they, if they're going to make a couple of seconds on the descent. The pros are different things, so please don't do that. So I guess, I mean, it would be pretty difficult to, to dodge a stone Basque fan if you're in that position. Is that what you're saying, man? Yes, yes, it would be, yeah. Good. And, and stones, normal stones as well, really hard. Oh, okay, good. Stoners and but, stoners. But of course, they I mean, they, they're great examples of visual examples, uh, Jamie, of the, the various uh, extreme positions. But there are a lot of things that we can do, normal people, you know, non professionals can do to reduce uh, their dynamic drag. Yes. Sorry, sorry, Mick, before you continue, because um, we did have a question come in from Sean Riles in Sweden who said, Is that Mick Rogers in a banana suit? It, that is, yeah. Mick, Mick, a few weeks ago, you were making fun of Alan Davis for wearing a banana costume, and this is a tight banana costume, mate. Yeah. No, yeah, well, I, I borrowed it from Alan. Yeah. yeah. Actually, yours looks half peeled, Mick. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but actually, Mick, I mean, that with, mean? That, with that white helmet, mate, you look like a banana split. You've even got the ice cream scoop on top and everything. <laughs> you have half of the banana showing. Anyway, we should, we should move on, guys. Sorry, sorry, Mick, we cut you off, so... So we got to don't try this at don't home. Don't try that home. And I'll give a few and, other pieces of advice. So shoot away. Here we are. Yep. So as I said, there are there are a bunch of things that we can do, and and they don't have huge costs um, to get that aerodynamic drag down. Um, Ninety percent of drag comes from your body position. So yep. just going everything you can to get down, get get your body, keep those shoulders in. Um, knees in, elbows in, head down. Of course, you don't have to go to such extremes as in, in the visual pictures, but just a small change in lowering your head or, or maybe rounding your shoulders, just that little bit can actually make huge differences. And if you can start to add up, you know, three watts here by curling your shoulders, you know, uh, two watts by getting your head down. There we go, Jamie, you're doing well, getting your head down. Great work. I, I do. I do practice this um, yeah. on the indoor trainer. You no, know? no, really, really. I mean, I do, yeah. Like I, I get like, even the indoor trainer. My kids sometimes say, "Dad, what are you doing?" Because I get in the, I do get in the extreme frumi position sometimes on the indoor trainer as well at home. And my wife actually, I mean, it's not a big deal now because you know we we had our four kids and then I had that <laughs> operation, you know. But it it is. It is, it is aero, but it's difficult. It's difficult to hold. You do look a bit stupid sometimes. Um, Mick, can you talk to us about clothing? Because we had a question coming in from Andy Bruce. I've got to explain something because Andy's Scottish, right? And, you know, up there in the highlands of Scotland, it's very cold. So men there, they do have a lot of body hair. So keep them warm. And Andy, Andy actually wrote a question saying, is being naked on a bike more aerodynamic than a skin suit? Um... Well, that'd be good research to do. Um, I'm not aware of anything. I mean, you know, I'm not going to volunteer to do it, but 
I mean, if any of you guys want to volunteer to do it, that'd be fine. But skin's actually the fastest. Shave skin, Jamie, is actually the fastest um, material. That's an interesting point, actually. Yeah. So what do we do, Mick? Do we have our do we have our high socks or should we have our shaved legs? <laughs> um, <laughs> that would we so we see a huge amount of um, you know time trials, especially time trials, using the really high yeah you know, booties, the high socks. Um, whereas in our days, Mick, you know, as you can remember, especially on the track, you, you need to go without socks. Um, so it's kind of done a three sixty turn. Yeah, but I mean, but, but I mean, in all seriousness, what you want to do with your clothing is you, you want to reduce any kind of any flapping um jerseys um you know, you know when it's when it's not raining or when it's not too cold get rid of those vests get rid of those jackets anything that is very you know increases that that volume of your body you need to get rid of just a just an interesting little uh, little tip here i can remember um oh, probably about 2010 we were just doing some some testing on the velodrome and at 45 kilometers an hour, we tested the difference between a skin suit and having just a light long sleeve jersey on. And the difference in speed was amazing. So, I mean, at the time, we were, I think I was testing it at 300 watts of constant speed. By just by taking that long sleeve jersey off, speed increased by one kilometer an hour. One, wow. ki one kilometer an hour. That's a long one. This is also, I mean, um, yeah. you know, and I guess it's pros, Mick. I mean, you know, you're involved clearly now, even yeah. with the NTT on the performance side. So, you know, you guys can test suits. You can test, I mean, helmets, of course, incredibly important in terms of the drag between aero helmet and the fully vented helmet. Um, you guys can test in a wind tunnel, you know, clothing and, and vice. I mean, maybe, maybe you can just quickly talk us through some of the bike aspects and then talk to us how do we as real world people do some testing of our equipment when we don't have access to a wind tunnel. Sure. So what, what you want to do with your bike, um, you want to concentrate your effort onto the front end of the bike. So the sections of the bike that's breaking the wind. So that's your forks, um, your front wheel, your, uh, your handlebars. Yeah. You want to start to play around with them. A great tip is to play around with, if you have the possibility to play around with some, some handlebar width, because you can get, you know, from a, a scoop down to something, down yeah. to something a lot narrower. Um, if you have the ability to get some, some aero handlebars, some fast forks, um, you know, tear shaped forks, they're going to make a difference compared to the back end of your bike. I mean, there's, there's no sense in investing a lot of money purchasing aerodynamic equipment for the back end of the bike because it's simply not touching the wind as much as the front end. Good point, Mick. Another what really- about the cables? Sorry. Sorry, mate. Yeah, no, no, continue. I was, I was just about to say, even like little things like the cables, right? Just, just why, why have an extra couple of inches of cables or centimeters of cables when you know, don't need it? especially the, the front end, right? Absolutely. And just an interesting, just an interesting one on that, Alan, um, just to tell you the, 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 the difference that aerodynamic drag can create. If you were to stick a simple pen on the side of your handlebar, just stick it perpendicularly out in the wind and ride 45 kilometers an hour, that simple pencil or pen on the side would have the same effect as adding a kilo of body weight. Wow. Well, that's why it's really, really important to, to get those cables as close to the frame as you can. If you can put them through the frame by buying a, an aero bike or the latest generation bikes, yeah. great. But really do everything you can, even, even right down to the type of bar tape that has a massive, massive influence on, on aerodynamic drag. So maybe uh, what we can do, I think definitely in the show notes, we can, we can put yeah. some links to some websites which provide some of the real good technical information here, Mick. I mean, last thing, because part of Peter's question, I think, was around like wheels and stuff. I mean, you mentioned get rid of the cables, get rid of all that sort of peripheral stuff sticking out. The wheels really matter. And, and you know, we talk about stuff. Again, we don't want to get too technical. but They do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
listen, a, a good a good set of deep dish dish wheels will 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 decrease aerodynamic drag. Uh, spokes, you know, you want oval spokes instead of uh, round spokes. Um, another one, another really really good tip is is wider tires. You know, the old the old school method was was to have eighteen or nineteen mil tires. Uh, what we're finding out now is the tubeless tires that are a lot wider um, that make the gap between the forks and the tire smaller that causes the, the, the air to flow around the forks and instead of going up under the under the fork. So just by simple little things by maybe having a larger tire on the front and a thinner one on the back, uh, it can make a difference. And, and, you know, as I said, a watt here, two watts there, five watts here. Um, before you know it, you're up to 15 watts, and over a, over a 40 minute, one hour time trial, that's going to be a that's going to be a long way. I mean, Mick, there's you know, we Alan mentioned earlier about um, black bike shorts, but I mean, I've I've seen some pretty scary things in in bike races, mate. I mean, I remember being um, at the the Grand Fondo uh, World Qualifier in Cyprus a couple of years ago, and there was this Russian bloke there, and like he wasn't the skinniest guy and he was wearing a skin tight white, you know, skin suit. And it actually, it started to rain at one point and it just wasn't right. And I, like it might've been aerodynamic, but I mean, have a look at this photo here that you put in Mick. I mean, you put in this photo of the Danish team, mm -hmm. the, the pursuit team there. And I mean, they did win the gold medal, but is it really worth looking like that to win a medal? Like with this, this, this helmet? I mean, do you have an opinion on that, Professor Alvey? I mean, because there has to be a bit of aesthetics in the sport, doesn't there? I mean, we can't have people wearing white skin-tight suits and pock helmets, can we? <laughs> I, I don't know about the, the white skin-tight skin tight suit, but I, mate, if, I, I would wear any helmet um, available to go as fast as these, these Danish guys. Uh, I don't care what I look like. Um, they you know they they 're definitely the most aerodynamic um, skid leads available um, and then you know they they 're going as as they 're breaking world records like like having breakfast so I would take a world record over uh you know uh, no, but come on man, cause, cause and, and all, and all, 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 because earlier somebody mentioned Dan Martin and the Garmin team they were wearing these pock helmets back in two thousand and thirteen. They're not wearing them anymore, and that's not you know there, there must be a reason there because they are apparently one of the fastest helmets in the world, but people just won't wear them. So, oh, Mick, do you have an opinion on this? I don't know. Yeah, you should never, ever, ever sacrifice looks for speed. Well said, Michael. That's I mean, you should know that, Jamie. Never sacrifice looks for speed. Wait, <laughs> you know. Why, why, why do you think I, I actually became a Belgian, mate? Because, you know, the only championship I thought I had a chance of winning was the European one, you know. And so I, I sacrificed. I sacrificed a lot to, to look good, you know. I mean, yeah, I can't tell you how much flack I got from my Australian buddies when I raced that European Masters in a Belgian jersey last year. But, you know, I, I, so I'm with you, Mick. I'm with you. Uh, I sometimes for, for appearance. Yeah. Yeah. Mick, yep. I'll just, I'll just uh, bring it, I suppose, a little, bit, a little bit back to what you were saying before, which will relate a lot to the audience. Um, you mentioned, you know, anything over, you know, roughly about 16 kilometres an hour. Mm. So this also includes not only being on the descents or flat, fast terrain, it also helps on the ascents, on, you know, on, the, on the climbs, where you can be, you know, going at 20, 25 kilometres an hour. You will find aerodynamical gains, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point, Al. Yeah, really good point. You know, on those climbs where it's maybe two or three percent and and you know, you have a bunch there, hmm. you want to stay off the front or the side of the bunch. You you want to look for positions in the middle of the bunch where you can still have the benefit of the of the slipstream of the guys around you. Absolutely. I mean, that's that that's that's what cycling is about. That's what racing is about, is learning to to pull all these these little bits and pieces together and save a little bit here, save a little bit there. I agree, mate. When it's a full package, you know, uh, going back to, uh, to what we spoke about in some of the previous, um, uh, some of our previous webinars or episodes, 
is if you can get two hours deeper into the race and still have those glycogen stores, then, you know, we're talking about a complete different race here. You know, you have options. You, you're not just going up against the old brick wall because you're completely out of energy. All of a sudden you find yourself with those glycogen stores uh, not so empty and you're able to accelerate, you're able to, you still have legs at the end of the race. Look, guys, I think we definitely, I mean, uh, and for those of you, you know, we've been talking a lot, please do put those questions in there for us. We're looking at the chat, we're looking at the Q&A. Um, Mick, maybe just a few words on real, real world testing, like, like how do you test for aerodynamics if you don't have a wind tunnel? That's a good one, Jamie. Uh, so, we have a couple of options here. Uh, for those of you who are lucky enough to have a, an indoor wood velodrome, uh, so board velodrome, you can go down there, uh, you know, put your Garmin on, put a good computer on, and if you've got power cranks, that's even great, better. Um, and just circle around at a, at a constant speed. You know, anything over 40 kilometers an hour is really good. And just play around with positions. Try to hold it for a couple of laps. You know, try putting your head down. Try putting your head up, elbows out, elbows in. Just try around with some of these combinations until you get that optimal um performance of or optimal how can i say uh, compromise between comfort and speed um just be, be be a little bit aware of 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 getting too much speed at the at, at, at the cost of of comfort because they, they are a position is something you may need to hold up for you know 20 30 40 minutes up to an hour the second option uh, which is the, the budget testing. If you have a straight road uh, that starts with a small descent, so even if a very short descent, uh, get into position, stop pedaling, and just roll down the hill and keep going until you literally stop. And the position that takes you furthest down the road, that is the most aerodynamic position. So there's a few simple tips to what you can do. Uh, you know, wind tunnel testing on a budget, let's say it that way. Yeah. No, it's great. I mean, we're lucky enough here, I live near to Antwerp, we have, a, have an outdoor uh, concrete track, actually, like, like an all-weather track. Um, so I do my testing down there. I just go down the, and here in Belgium, we're lucky enough on a lot of these outdoor tracks, you can, you can ride on with your road bike. So that's terrific um, conditions because I get pretty stable conditions. I take my bike down there, my different suits, helmets, and yeah, it's really amazing what you see because... You know, maybe over three laps of the track, you know, like a thousand meters, it can be a second and a half, two seconds faster, you know, just in some simple, simple configurations and changes. And I guess the other thing there, Mick, and again, when, you know, Al and I go away for multi-day races, some of the big ones, um, you know, these, these savings, they accumulate over days, right? So if you're doing, you know, the, some of the multi-day races in Mallorca mm. or, you know, in the Alps even, or, or you know, Sardinia, the one Mel and I done a few times, Cool. These, these savings add up, right? Absolutely, absolutely, and and I can give you some real concrete information with that. Back uh, back when when skin suits were starting to come into the pro peloton, you know the road suit, they were a little bit different to the time trial suits. We had a pocket in the back. Yeah. Um, we had our team physi physiologist run the math on the advantages of wearing a skin suit in a road race for twenty one days of the Tour de France, and you'd be amazed. To, to know that over 21 days, the reduction in drag, when we work it out in actually the amount of calories or, kil or kilojoules of calorie burnt mm -hmm. in the race, by having a skin suit in calories wise, you rode one stage less. After 21. Than the rest of the group. One stage less. Yeah. In terms of calories that's amazing Al, you know how much that is i mean i don't know i mean can you imagine having an extra rest day <laughs> at the tour de france yeah staying in bed for the whole day we'll go guys exactly. I'll, I'll see you tomorrow yeah, yeah. i'm taking the day out guys <laughs> i mean i guess um you know just to summarize as well mick and you know we come back to the last point which you wanted to to raise again was just yeah. you know there's always a trade-off here yeah exactly um, and there is safety because, you know, again, you know, we talk about Froome Froom or Sagan or others, they're pros. They, they practice and practice and practice these kind of positions and techniques. So, sure. you know, I've, I've never had Professor LV advising me to get into the Superman position on a downhill 
you know, going combo, you know, but, and I've seen some pretty, pretty dangerous things happening, some crashes because of that. So I think we shouldn't, shouldn't forget that one. Um, the other thing I guess that strikes me about all this, Mick, is that a lot of what you're telling us is many of the big savings in terms of what's saved and aerodynamic efficiency are not, are pretty good in terms of bang for your buck. So some of the small change you mentioned around helmet, clothing, they're relatively inexpensive compared to the bike and the wheels and all that kind of stuff as well. So again, for a lot of amateur athletes, that really matters. Yeah. And that's why yeah. testing becomes important because, you know, you, you can go out and just buy the most expensive stuff or you can play around and test with things which take a bit of time but actually save you a lot of dollars. At the well, end. no, uh, just a really good point there because I'm just looking at the screen now and, and the vents on the helmet, yeah. Of course, if it's a hot if it's a hot summer day, you want to keep those vents open. Yeah. If it's a, a traditional Belgian wet and windy day, you want to cover those vents up with yeah. some 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 tape, and that costs five cents. And you can get a beautiful, really nice advantage out of that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I carry a I carry a roll of like this uh, ten centimeter electrical tape in my car, and I do exactly that. If I turn up and you know, the clouds come over, it's going to be a cool day. I just tape up the vents and, and away you go. You know, I don't bother taking three helmets to whip me. Exactly. Whip me every race. So, look, we've got, a, we've got a few minutes for questions. We're going to, we're going to wrap it up soon. So, I'm looking at the, um, the Q&A box. I think Andy Bruce, Andy's comment on the naked time trialing thing. I think the Scotsman's going to get the record tonight. I think he's got, he deserves the Eddie Merckx. Um, so, thanks for, the, thanks for that, Andy. Um, I'm just looking now, we've got the chat. Any other last, from you, Professor Albi, I mean, in terms of what we've covered tonight, or anything that particularly stands out for you on either the descending or the, uh, the aerodynamics topic? Yeah, I think uh, one, one, uh, one thing we, we just touched on actually, Mick, Mick himself, that stands out to me, um, you know, and to all of us on this, on the show as co-host and our audience, uh, Mick mentioned it and I often, uh, I often mention it myself. It's that's what makes the beauty of cycling. That's that's what where we're here. Yeah, you know, where all these things that we're talking about. That's what makes cycling beautiful. It's so dynamic in so many ways. You know, we've we've been giving you plenty of tips um, that that can improve your cycling. But uh, just going stepping back away from it and just looking at it as as uh, from the helicopter view. That's what makes the sport so beautiful, um, and to be able to, you know, to to be a part of it for so long, and also to give back to you guys now is a uh, is an absolute pr privilege, and uh, just reminds me of uh, of how much I love the sport, Mick. So thanks for mentioning that, mate. Sure. Yeah, Mick, just two two more quick aero ones: shoe yep. covers and disc wheels. Shoe covers and disc wheels. Okay. Um, I think the jury is out on, on shoe covers. Um, there has been testing to suggest that it makes a small difference. Um, wind tunnel suggests that, that actually taking shoe covers off, particularly if you've got lace up shoes, the old laces, that is the most aerodynamic mm. uh, option. I don't know why it seems to be some kind of phenomenon that the laces actually breaks up the air and, and, and forces it around the foot. Um, but the jury's still out on that. Disc wheels, was that the other one? Yeah, disc wheels, that was another question. Should I bother with the disc? Disc wheels, massive advantage, massive advantage. Um, you also have the rolling effect, so you have a lot more inertia in a disc wheel. Uh, there's always, what's interesting now is, is what we're learning about the trade-off between weight and aerodynamics. And uh, just a, a bit of a tip for everyone here, there's a fantastic website called uh, Best Bike Splits, I think it is. Um, and you can simulate, you can put, you can upload a GPX file of the course you want to do, and it will tell you the best pacing strategy for that particular course. But what you can also do is you can also start to play around uh, with, with the CDA values. I mean, it's a little bit technical. Uh, you can start to, you know, to say, if you understand what the advantage of to CDA is to a disc wheel, you can start to calculate, all right, is this disc wheel faster over this hilly course, considering it could be half a kilogram lighter. 
So it's a it's very advanced mathematical models, but a wonderful site. Um, I'm also just looking at uh, a, a question from Andy Bruce, uh, Jamie, about uh, is it the Notio CDA testing? I don't know much about that. Um, I know there are a few of these. I think it might be a device that's coming uh, that gives dynamic uh, CDA, so real time CDA values. There are a couple of couple coming to the market, and they're very interesting. Just briefly, CDA. What's CDA? Coefficient. Um, so it's basically the, the coefficient of your aerodynamic drag. Okay, good. You know, because I, I know that what's his name? Um, De Ghent, You know the Belgian guy who, who's the. I mean, they tested his face, and apparently, like his face was more aerodynamic without a visor and sunglasses as well. So there's really interesting stuff like that, and this again comes down to you're making the assumptions by wearing the full aero helmet and the visor. You're going to be more aero, but apparently De Ghent's got a big nose. And the airflow was just like whooshing off his face because he's got, you know, that kind of kind of face. So I don't know about you, Mick, because did you ever get your face tested when you were going for the worlds and stuff? No, nah, not my face. No, no, no. My nose wasn't that big, so. Quite, quite pointy, though. What about Degan? He's always got a beard, though, Jamie. He seems to always have a, has a sports a beard quite often now. I'm sure they've tested it, Mick. You know what I mean? Must be a reason why, mate. No, no, he hides his power bars in there. <laughs> <laughs> he hides his what? And gels. He puts his gels and stuff in there. Ah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah. multi-powered. That's good. Great. Great. I think we've I think we've covered um, most of the questions. That's all good. So, so with that, I mean, uh, what I'd like to do, we maybe we should wrap it up. We've almost come to our end of our hour. So, I'm um, definitely look, we'd like to thank everybody for the fantastic questions. As we said. Andy Bruce, top, I mean, great questions in there. So the, the Eddie Merck single will be coming to you. Um, we'd like to thank all of you, of course, for joining us tonight. Of course, Sean Rolls uh, in Sweden. We always give a special thanks to because Sean's supporting us big time writing up the show notes. So after this episode, give us a couple of days, we'll put up the show notes with links to all the websites on aerodynamics and, and uh, stuff that we've, we've touched upon. Um, a thanks also to Mitch Docker, uh, our pal at Life in the Peloton, if you haven't listened to his podcast please go across there and, and, and have a listen. Um, of course, uh, thanks also to our pal Ramandeep Singh to speak your ideas who, who host the session for us, um, technically uh, help us out there. Um, and of course, what we'd also like to do is encourage all of you um, to connect with us. If you haven't already done that on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, um, please, please do. Uh, you'll get our contact info in the show notes. Um, take a look at our YouTube channel. Uh, we've now got more than 20 videos, interviews with Doug Ryder, Matt White, Magnus Bags, there's a whole bunch of people and more are uh, coming in constantly. So with that, I'd like to ask my uh, co-host to offer you their final words of wisdom. Always from Michael Rogers, what would you like to finish with, Mick? If it doesn't happen in training, it ain't happening racing. And Alan Davis? Uh, I'll go back to the breakaway. If only workers as hard as the least working rider in the breakaway. Excellent. Thank you. And of course, my advice is your hard days are only as good as your easy days. So thanks to you all for joining us uh, and look forward to seeing you on the next edition of This Cycling Life. Bye, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you.